the Iron Lands. Where men draw blood over the rights to ancient ruins. While the firstborn watch in anger and despair. As the boots of warbands walk the path of death and glory, ready to bring the downfall of the old world to these new, unbroken shores. These are the Iron Lands. Where the lone wolf battles every day to claw another shred of life from this hard, uncaring soil. War is brewing in the north, and the broken tribes are stirring, while petty kings risk ruin for the hope of a worthless crown. Your road is long and weary, wolf, and beset by horrors you may not yet fathom. Go then, wolf. Draw another breath from this frigid air. And know that every one of them could be your last. A shipwreck. That's how it starts. Shattering the vessel upon the rocks of the barrier isles of the coast, the ragged coast of the Iron Lands. We don't know how many survivors there are, we only know of one. A sodden, sorry figure lying face first in the coarse wet sand, little strip of sand between the lapping waves and the rocky shoreline leading up to a cliff face. And he's surrounded by a selection of detritus from the wreckage. Treated planks of wood, a rope here and there, frayed, canvas torn, a couple of barrels, even a chest or two beaten up by the sea. This is Kainan, our hero for want of a better term. Now, Kainan already has a character sheet that we created in a previous video, just Focusing on the character creation. I want to summarize it real quick so you don't have to go and watch that now. Kynan is a relic hunter, some would say, grave robber, some others would say. This is a career path open to the desperate in these Iron Lands, in this version of the Iron Lands. Because there's a lot of ancient ruins about from some precursor civilization that existed on this continent, no one really knows who they were. And these ruins have a slight disadvantage in that they very often overlap with the territory of beasts or firstborn who don't much like Ironlanders coming in there and intruding. But Ironlanders very much like going in there and intruding because there is treasure to be found. And more importantly, there's also caches of engraved iron ingots to be found, which is a special material that is the iron that is the magical version of iron, the iron that we swear vows on, the iron that makes us iron sword. So Kainan ran with a band of these lovely people, these uh, borderline bandits who set themselves apart a little bit uh, rung above by not preying on trade caravans but going after the ruins, which is a bit of a desperate scenario there because Kainan did not come up in that settlement. He came from a different settlement that we virtually know nothing about because it's not important for the current state of play. Maybe we will eventually elaborate on that. But for one reason or another he found himself at odds with the powers that be in the settlement and was cast out and so fell in with that lot of, well, tomb robbers, effectively. Ruin hunters. Although I suppose you don't really hunt ruins, they don't run very fast. We don't quite know yet what got Kainan into this predicament to find himself washed ashore, or surrounded by a ship's sorry remnants in the southern coast of the Ironlands, the ragged coast. But we know that he has lost his band. The band was misled, betrayed, something like that. We'll find out in a minute. 
which led to the death of one of his companions, Siora, who, uh, in the process of a relic hunt gone wrong, bef just before Kynan and his merry band of greedy bastards were about to unleash some horror on the world inadvertently, sacrificed herself, perished, but saved the surrounding area settlements from whatever was coming forth through the veil between realities and trying to eat our faces. So Siora is the companion that Kynan had a bond with in life and now shares a bond with in death because we have a asset card here, spirit bound, which means we are effectively haunted by Siora who doesn't too much enjoy the fact that she's dead. And she also kind of a little bit blames Kynan for it because she maybe felt a little bit pressured into sacrificing herself on account of Kynan very, very quickly running in the other direction. So not the most noble of people, but a very human person. <laughs> so we have Kynan, the ex-grave robber who is haunted by Siora, his former compatriot and still current compatriot, who is currently shipwrecked lying off the coast of the Ironlands. And that's in our version of the Ironlands because we also created a world version of the Ironlands in a another video, which you may freely go and watch, but you don't have to right now. Suffice it to say, these Ironlands are a bit of a, I would cliche call it dark fantasy affair where the Ironlanders were cast from the old world by a combination of invading tribes, disease and famine and over farming uh, two, three generations ago and they are up to their old tricks again up here. So uh, settlements emerged, they drove the firstborn off, the firstborn being the elves, the giants, the Varu, which is kind of a wolfkin race, and the trolls, let's not forget the trolls. How could we, we're on the internet. And in these two, three generations, the Ironlanders have pretty much spread themselves out quite far along the ragged coast, the havens, the flooded lands, the hinterlands, Everything kind of surrounding the deep wilds where the elves mainly have retreated into. And in that period, sort of petty kings emerged more like, you know, village elders that then styled themselves the baron, and then another village joined the fray, joined the fold rather, and then it kind of got to their head. And within a generation or two, you suddenly have someone who thinks they can lay claim on the entire Ironlands for justice and whatever else you can come up with, mainly greed. So within the havens and the hinterlands to some extent where most of the civilization is clustered, we have conflict brewing. We also have the broken tribes, the some human remnants of a civilization, maybe that precursor civilization, we don't know, who don't communicate with the Ironlanders, they just attack on site. They're rumored to be cannibalistic. They're also around. So we have the Ironlanders and also with the Firstborn, with each other, with the Broken. Yeah, it's just generally being people. <laughs> and the one special thing I should mention is the iron. So this engraved iron that uh, Kainan is also hunting for in his uh, career, former career as a tomb robber, a ruin delver, which is a material that they found when they landed in the Ironlands. Mainly, uh, first off, the, the contact they had with it were some already present iron pillars that had been erected uh, strewn throughout the landscape by whoever, we don't know. There was a big question mark on that. But what the Ironlands quickly found out was that the firstborn who pushed back against them, trying to drive them back into the sea, wouldn't go near those things. So that's where the Ironlanders built their first settlements. And then eventually finding tools made from that material, they learned how to mine that material, for lack of a better word, from these pillars. So a little bit of a, you know, shave a little bit off and then turn it into some arrowheads or a blade for a dagger or, you know, eventually once you find more and more of this and push further into the Ironlands, some swords, which creates these sort of magical iron weapons. Not really magical, they just have... Uh, so they add a special layer of fear for the firstborn who don't much enjoy going near it. Which is why the Ironlanders are very um, fond of this iron and swear their iron vows on it. So that's why we call them the Ironlands. So that's our version of the world. One thing Kaina is still missing is a background vow, which is what every character starts off with. And I wanted to establish that in the course of our first session of play. So as Kaina sort of groans himself awake, pushes off the sand and his eyes stinging with sand and salt. 
He takes in that dawn scenery of wreckage and just general mess around them. And his hand instinctively reaches for his throat where he has a, like, a little loop of strap of leather and a hoop of, of iron, a wrought, slightly ornamented iron, represented here by our prop department of uh, taking something I had before and making that into Kynan's thing. And since we don't really know yet whether any of Kynan's equipment survived or any of his uh, gear is still there and intact, uh, we have the hoop that we can swear our first iron vow on, our background vow, which we, we're not gonna roll for, we're just gonna establish now that this is what Kynan sets out to do, his main quest, the driver that makes him engage with the Ironlands. And so as he struggles up to his feet, pushes himself unsteadily, standing there a little bit shaky, he grabs onto this metal hoop and makes a vow except we first need somebody to vow on because this involves a person and this person needs a name so let's make our first role that is the beauty of iron sworn you can literally make it up as you go along and we're supported in this endeavor by a number of tables called oracles which also contain names of various races including the ironlanders and we are going to swear this vow in relation to another ironlander so let's find out what they're called 71. We have two Ironlander naming tables in the Lodestar supplement, which are also found in the Ironsworn source book, which by the way is free to download. And our naming options are Razina and Kalidas. Wow, Kalidas sounds like someone I want to curse. So we are going with Kalidas. And Kalidas was the leader of our former band of misfits and it is to him that Kynan attributes all the misfortune that befell him and Siora and the others. We don't know how many others there were. Oh, and by the way, this misfortune is so relatively recent that Kynan doesn't know about the spirit bound yet. He hasn't officially begun being haunted yet. This is about to happen. But first we gotta curse Kalidas. We gotta swear a vow to drive us through our Ironland journey. Kalidas, Kynan, says to the wind, I will find you and I will make you pay. So uttering this curse in a loud, clear voice, we can also write it down on our character sheet. Find Kalidas and make him pay. That is an epic vow because we are currently at the very southern tip of the Ironlands and the way I picture this, this whole affair played out very far in the north. So at some point we must have found our way on a ship. Kynan does not actually know about this part. The last thing he remembers is the whoosh of something going horribly wrong, Siora's scream of death and agony, and then it's like lights out. So we have a bit of a cut in the memory. I know, that's a bit of a, you know, we, we remember most of our lives. It's the memory loss is just maybe a couple of days, presumably. And to my mind, there's also a good reason for it, especially with the horror being involved, trying to come into the world and whatever Kalidas was up to. The, the nice thing about this is we don't really need to know all of these things yet. They will emerge as a sort of a meta plot the more we move towards this, but it's an epic vow because we have to move quite a bit, make sure that we find Kalidas, figure out where he's gone now, what he's up to. But at least now we know who and what we're after, first and foremost. We're after revenge, compensation, maybe we want to really make him pay. It's like, hey, dude, give him, you know, put it here. Now, after Kainan has shouted his vow to the wind, he should probably focus on a few more practical things, which is to find out what he still has and what he is missing, what is there to be salvaged. I feel like to reflect our shipwreck, we're leaving our supply status on our character sheet a little bit uncertain at the moment, and we make a resupply move, which is to salvage and, and, and you know look at the wreckage and see what we can find to, first of all, illustrate what a move is, and second of all, find out how many supplies we can uh, count on. I don't want to go down to zero supplies on a miss because then we're already in a status like in a debility status that is uh, unprepared which means we have all sorts of problems and this all of a sudden turns into a hardcore survival game which is 
not really the journey start I had envisioned, but we may be very low on supplies, which creates a certain sense of urgency to find a settlement and sojourn there, resupply there. So to make a move in Iron Swarm, we take two 10-sided dice, which are the challenge dice representing the well, odds we're up against, and we do roll a six-sided die, and we add our statistics, our stats that are representing our abilities as a character that we distributed during character creation, plus any other applicable bonuses from previous moves we've made or any move um, additions we have here from talents or paths or rituals. And if the combined result of all of these bonuses and the die six uh, beats the challenge dice, we have what is called a strong hit on both die, a weak hit if it's one die or a miss if it's none die. So let us resupply, which is a move that is when you hunt for it or scavenge roll plus wits on a strong hit, you bolster resource it and we take some supply. On a weak hit, we take some supply but suffer one momentum, which is sort of our representation of the um, wind at our backs that we have throughout the story. And on a miss, we find nothing. So that puts us at a range of supply that we can be at, I think, between one and three. So let's roll plus wits. That is a weak hit because our wits is two. We definitely did not beat a nine, but we definitely beat a one. And now I gotta think whether I want to sacrifice two momentum to uh, get three supply. I think I do because at the moment this is kind of a representation of the obstacle we're facing that our journey is just not off to a very good start right now. So Kynan climbs around the wreckage, prying open barrels that are still shut, finding dried rations and uh, whatever else he needs to supply himself, maybe a couple of arrows. Uh, one thing I, I would like to ask the Oracle about is whether we actually find weapons. I think one thing I would like to determine is that we have a little dagger still on our side, but I don't know whether we have a sword or a bow. So we're going to ask the Oracle, which is um, which is another mechanic we can use to substitute that we're not having a dungeon master with us here. So we're going to determine that it's unlikely that we have a bow with us. And so we roll a percentage die to check whether we manage to get to a 76 or greater, which would mean that an unlikely result manifests. We get a 42, which is the meaning of life, but also the meaning of we're not having a bow, which kind of makes sense, I think. Same goes for a sword or other close combat weapon. Let's see whether, unlikely enough, there is one near us. No. So we have a dagger, we have some supplies, some rations, some arrows, but we have nothing to shoot them with. And we are pretty much dressed in our, well, let's call it a leather coat with some hardened leather plates, a bit of ring mail on it in pieces, in parts and maybe a sudden wolf fur cloak and a pair of decidedly soaked woolen travel pants, plus boots. And with that, we are wondering what's gonna happen next. And again, we asked the Oracle to understand what is going to happen next. What is the world gonna do to us? What's the dungeon master got in store for us? For this, we have two oracles that we can combine to understand the sort of the impetus of the story, action and theme. So we are gonna roll up an action first, which is 81. That is uh, defend. <laughs> this sounds uh, like it's going somewhere. And the theme is three, price. Well, the only price I can think of is the stuff that we just grabbed from the wreckage. So what I think happens is that we're not the only ones here. Perhaps there is a settlement nearby or maybe just a lair of some sort, we may find out. And let's say maybe a couple of denizens have, maybe they pulled guard duty during the night, they saw in the early morning mist some stuff coming ashore that usually doesn't come ashore between the usual seaweed and dead fish. We all of a sudden have some treated curved planks of wood and they decided to come down the beach and investigate. So we all of a sudden have company. I think we're gonna use the Raider template from the source book here, which puts us at a bit of a disadvantage. Um, we're gonna, maybe they're ill-equipped Raiders. They're just like, is there more than two? I don't think that's very likely. 
No, there is definitely no more than two. So we have two raiders on our hands, maybe ill-equipped raiders that in combination, while they would normally be troublesome foes, in this case they are combined into one progress bar, which makes them one dangerous foe. So let us mark down a dangerous encounter here and call them Raider Salvagers times two. This means that both of those are represented in one progress track when it comes to resolving our combat. The goal of a combat encounter, if we have one, if we don't manage to talk our way out of this, is to fill up as many boxes as we can by causing harm so we can make a move that is end the fight, which in this case we then roll the challenge dice against the progress we've accumulated. Fairly straightforward and very elegant system. So Kainan is not in the best position here, he's not very well armed. He is an experienced fighter, but he favors the bow. And he is a bit of a sneaky one. He is a very good uh, infiltrator. He can um, hide very well. And I think that's the first thing we're gonna try and do is to um, use stealth to our advantage and like see if we can find a suitable position where as soon as we see the two figures like sort of coming up into view on the beach, probably mostly looking down, trying to see what has washed ashore, kind of uses the split second to dive behind the chest and, and like go prone and reach for his dagger. I think the way Kainan is wired, he while he doesn't seek armed confrontation, he's definitely a friend of ambushes and he doesn't really believe that those two are going to be easily talked out of doing whatever they want to do now to get the stuff into their hands. There's two of them, they're armed, he's gonna lose his supplies, he's fighting effectively to protect his chance at survival. So we're gonna use the secure and advantage move using shadow to hide and lie in wait to see whether we can like pounce out of stealth and just immediately take one of them out, perhaps even secure whatever weapon they come with. And that's what we represent kind of like diving for cover, going prone and reaching for his dagger just in time to not, hopefully not be spotted um, with, with this die roll. That's looking pretty good. So we roll a five against a seven and a three and Shadow is Kynan's strong suit. So we end up with a total of nine, which secures us a strong hit on the advantage. We can take control and turn that into a plus one on the next move. Or we can take some momentum by preparing to act. I think we're gonna take the momentum just so we can um, build up a little bit of something and they're a bit too far away to act. So we're lying in wait, we're waiting for them to come closer. And they do come closer fairly leisurely. They don't really seem to expect anyone to be here. They just probably correctly guess that a ship got smashed against the barrier isles and that the currents carried uh, whatever cargo was still floating to the shores that they are currently wandering, but they don't necessarily maybe expect there to be people about. So they're not particularly on their guard. And they're talking to each other in hoarse voices, uh, mumbling to each other, like, all right, look at this one, there's a, there's a little treasure chest over there. And so their eyes light up as they lay sight on those barrels. It's like, hey, maybe there's some rum in those. And kind of uses that, um, distraction that they provide for each other to sort of slowly shuffle around the side as they move closer, keeping the obstacles between himself and the potential assailants, and just gets himself ready to leap over and pounce with his dagger out as soon as they're within striking distance, which is a move we call enter the fray, and since we're doing it as an ambush, we're using it with the shadow stat, which is our strong suit. So we're entering the fray with Shadow, and we actually get a strong hit here. So six plus four is 10, we have to beat a nine, barely scraping by, but we, we jump on over, we take the initiative, we take two more momentum as Kynan leaps across the sort of half embedded wreckage surrounded treasure chest between him and the first guy sort of coming to, to bend down and tries to bring his knife down and to 
the nape of his neck. So we're gonna strike and we're gonna use the iron stab because we are in close combat and we'll see if we can uh, do some harm and if we can retain the initiative. We can do some harm, but we do lose the initiative because that is a weak hit. That is a three plus iron, which is also a three. That makes it six. We don't beat the seven. We get a weak hit. On a weak hit, we inflict our harm and we lose the initiative. So we're armed. That means we inflict two harm on these opponents. And since they're dangerous foes, each point of harm we inflict manifests in two full filled boxes of progress, which marks four full filled boxes of progress right now for this encounter and since we're having mm, two enemies and one gets you know, stabbed in the neck muscles with our dagger we maybe we overextend like the guy stumbles forward and pulls kind of down us a little bit he stumbles back tries to rip the dagger out but this gives the other companion of his a chance to engage and, and sort of pull out his hand axe that he has and, and come for Kynan. They're two raggedy looking fellows, definitely on the unsavory side of things, like tangled beards and pockmarked faces, fairly grubby armor, like a padded coat that has seen better days. And one of them seems to be clearly a deserter because he's got some, some made up badge of some petty king from somewhere far away on his coat so the axe comes towards Kynan and he has to face danger to well he could also clash so there's two options we have we can clash with the enemy which means we can also inflict harm or we can face danger if we think that we want to minimize the harm that we endure ourselves i think in this case it actually makes more sense to clash with him because we want to take them down as quickly as we can and yeah, so we're gonna like whirl around, like go into this knife fighting stance <laughs> and wait for, for the explo to sink so we can like lunge forward and take a stab of our own. Let's see how that goes for us. When your foe has initiative and you fight with them in close quarters, roll iron and that is what we're going to do. We have three iron and we roll pretty well. We actually have a strong hit here. This is going uh, much better than my campaign that I don't record, which I have a character whose first five rolls were misses. On a strong hit, inflict your harm and choose one. You have the initiative. You bolster your position, take plus one momentum. You find an opening, inflict plus one harm. Um, playing it safe would be to take the plus one harm because that would put us at a lovely nine progress. Let me think. So it's kind of a choice between having the momentum in the here and now or having it carry over into uh, the adventure. I think Kaina is more concerned with the here and now. So he inflicts a plus one harm, which translates into two more progress, which then means we can use the initiative to end the fight. So we are evading the axe blow. We are lunging forward and like trying to bury that knife in the neck of the guy who is trying to take our head off. Uh, we roll the two challenge die against the 10 progress we have. So unless we roll two tens, we've got this in the back. Two fives, that's a double. That is actually a uh, good thing for us because we, we succeed at this. So the knife goes in the blood starts spurting out the guy drops to his knees with a gurgle as we've learned from christopher lee people who get stabbed don't make a lot of noise the other guy is already down like clutching his bleeding neck and was like pretty much passing out so both of them are felled in two quick combat moves from ambush which is just the way Kynan likes to play it. And we get a double, which is, which is actually called a match, I forgot that. So matches, if we roll on a move and we get a match, we have something good, interesting, complicating happen. And if we're not sure what this could be, we can ask an oracle. Is there something immediately obvious that we could turn this match into is there anything that strikes us as you know in your face obvious from from this encounter those guys were pretty raggedy they don't have much on them we have the hand axe now 
So we can mark that down. What was the other guy fighting with? Presumably short sword, let's say. But I think Kainan favors the hand axe in this case. So like a, you know, like not, a, not quite the woodcutter's axe from Skyrim, but close. <laughs> so I think we're gonna ask an oracle here what the complication, the good result, the um, blessing in disguise is. Action roll is 62. Overwhelm. 48. Overwhelm. Depth. Hmm. We also have the option to reverse rolls. So we have Overwhelm, which was a 60, uh, 62. We can turn that into a 26 to see if that fits better. Withdraw. And the depth was 48, which turned into 84. Withdraw Spirit. Withdraw spirit. So something heartening happens. We perhaps, um, we rifle through the packs of these uh, two gentlemen and we find some more rations and some other youthful stuff and we take one supply. I think that's a decent outcome. So Kynan stands above these two corpses, just, you know, barely registering what has just happened. Just, that's his life. It's, it's conflict out of nowhere. Uh, that's the life of the outcast, of the, of the bandit, the borderline bandit. When he hears a familiar voice from behind him, around him, he can't quite place it. Uh, mocking tone, didn't take you long to start killing again. And he, dagger in hand, still like slowly turns and... Knowing there is no one there, thinking he's imagining it, recognizing this as Siora's voice, who cannot be here because he distinctly remembers as one of the last things he does remember seeing her die. So I think he's against engaging in banter with thin air and chooses to say nothing, just rubbing his eyes and not really reacting much. Got, Got nothing, nothing to say to, say to an old friend. friend. Now he frowns and like, looks around more thoroughly, still there is nobody there but he's starting to realize this voice isn't maybe just tiredness and overwhelmed senses. This is probably something more. And since this is the Iron Lands, hauntings aren't that unusual. So he sighs. You're, You're dead, dead Siora. You, you left, left me, me behind. behind. And now he's standing at a beach, trying to justify himself to the wind. Your leg was gone. What am I, a horse to be put out of its misery? You could have come back and carried me. Can't really argue with that. He could have done that, but he is no hero. So he goes straight into what he usually does when he wants to suss out where a situation is going. What do you want? You've left me up there, Kainan. I'm still up there. Still in that cursed place. Get me out of there. Lay me to rest, or I swear you will never be rid of me. And while he probably thinks some company is nice, he has a distinct feeling that this isn't going to play very much into his advantage if he ignores her, so he... <sighs> goes for that iron again. And we make our inciting incident vow, which is the quest that we go on now that may also intersect with other quests that probably will, because we also have to travel a huge distance and with a lot less enthusiasm than when he was uh, cursing Kalidas, Kainan swears to Siora that uh, I will find what remains of you and I will lay you to rest.